university um, and has been here since the since before the inception of the university uh, when it was first um, conceived as a plan. Um, so we are very glad that um, he's spending some time with us. And uh, we were discussing uh, this famous incident in um, Harvard, which seems to have had repercussions uh, later on. Uh, but as you know, Vinod circulated a piece called Empty Economic Boxes. It's a very old essay, um, which is also critical of uh, Alfred Marshall and the orthodoxy of the time. So the idea of questioning what's taught is, is uh, an old idea. It's almost a conservative idea. But uh, since this is now current, we thought we'd have a discussion on it. Uh, with uh, Steve leading us, uh, uh, leading the discussion. So it's not meant to be a, a pontification or a lecture or something, but it's meant to be very participative where we um, hope we'll be challenged with some questions from Steve um, to respond to. That, over to you. Thank you very much. This is uh, a real pleasure for me. Look at this turnout. First of all, uh, to everybody, I want to celebrate International Women's Day. This, and you get extra points if you turn the questions into something relevant to the condition of women globally as we proceed with this discussion along the lines that Sudarshan just outlined. So that picture up there is actually the face of uh, Mankey and the building where the economics department lodges and you can see out of his other sunglass uh, the demonstration that we're going to talk about a little bit. So the topic is from Ek Ten Walk Out to the Iconocracy. What I propose, since this is supposed to be a discussion that I'm guiding, what I propose is a three-part discussion around questions. The first is the nature and the place of students challenging professors' choice of materials and methods. After all, what, these, what are these people doing? Professors are people you look up to. You don't challenge them and demonstrate and walk out of their classes and challenge them and create an organization and publish a book denouncing how they teach. That'll be the first set of questions I'd like to address. The second is, well, in both of these incidences, they related to courses at very prestigious institutions on economics. Well, what are the challenges of learning economics, actually? What, are we, what is it really all about? What is this debate all about? What's wrong with economics? that you don't find in physics or mechanics or even political science or history and so on. Why economics? What is special about the learning of economics that leads to such contestation? And third, if economics is in any way, shape, or form relevant to what's really going on in the world, what are some of the critical issues that sort of you will want to grapple with as you're seeking to apply learning in economics to policy issues and to your professional activities, whatever they might be. So if you agree with this, this is the agenda I'm proposing, these three parts on board. And of course, you can challenge it from the perspective of International Women's Day or anything you like. All right, let's get into the uh, first part now. So the nature and place, yes, we're going to switch because unfortunately this was embedded. Let's try one more time to see if the embedding works, but I doubt it will. How do we get that maybe to work? All right, so I cleverly embedded it into my presentation and um, not so cleverly the uh, uh, system doesn't work here. So we have to switch over to another copy of this very short film. Well, um, it's being set up. Uh, I wanted to say that, uh, as Sudarshan mentioned, in the course of our conversation uh, about the uh, Manchester debate, I happened to mention that in a seminar I teach to freshmen at Harvard University called uh, Human Rights Between Rhetoric and Reality. I get some very bright students, because we so between rhetoric and reality, obviously we're questioning at every stage what's going on, whether human Maybe rights. OK, let's can, can we pause it? Pause it. So um, 
one of the students in my class uh, was better prepared than anybody else. They were all quite well prepared. By the way, students, when they're that age, they don't hesitate to accept a reading assignment of two or 300 pages, and they'll come having read the materials. When they get to upper class at Harvard College, they're a little more demanding, and when they get to the graduate schools where I teach, I'm lucky if I can get them to read 30 pages. But. So while you are undergraduates, keep at it, accept heavy reading assignments, uh, it will uh, pay off in the end. So Rachel uh, was um, a student in my class who was uh, remarkably well prepared, plus having original ideas Wall Street. There was also an Occupy Harvard. And one day, uh, as our class was about to begin, she wasn't there. And she showed up late, which was very unlike Rachel. And she said, I'm sorry I'm late. I was." Um, involved in Occupy Harvard. In fact, she was very much involved in Occupy Harvard. Uh, she's a diminutive, unassuming young person. Uh, and yet, when I said, all right, this is obviously a teaching moment. We're going to set aside what we had for today. Occupy Harvard is going on. Rachel, you've just come from it. What has this got to do with our topic of human rights between rhetoric and reality? And Rachel, in typical fashion, just went right into a structured, well thought out, documented, evidence-based exposition about what was really going on. Not the sort of generalities of saying we're fighting the capitalist system. She was fighting, she was citing the articles and amounts in the custodial staff's contracts that they were fighting for the custodial staff, but not just in the abstract, in the very concrete, and, uh, and how that expanded into a set of other agenda items. So the same Rachel got involved in, um, in this. And if, could we go back just a couple of seconds? Introducing it at the very beginning there. Yeah, OK. So let's turn the volume up and see if we can hear this. That's Rachel. And cuts to public education, things like that. Issues that tend to affect, you know, public school students more than Harvard students. We want to stand with them in solidarity. What they show you here is the growth in income from 19. Okay, so back to the PowerPoint. So uh, the students who staged the walk, and you can see it wasn't a um, dramatic walkout in which everybody left. There's 700 students, by the way, who take Ec 10. Economics 10 is the required undergraduate course in economics, and um, uh, and there's 700 students in the class. Uh, 750. 750 is the yeah, current uh, total enrollment in it, and. Um, so you saw Rachel and then John Rosenthal was the other one. They're two students, very committed to their studies. One saying, this is ridiculous, let's go back to class. And the other one is saying, in this letter, this is the actual letter that they sent to uh, Professor Mankiw, uh, in which they said, today we are walking out of your class, Economics 10, in order to express our discontent with the bias inherent in this, econ in this introductory economics course. We are deeply concerned about the way that this bias affects students, the university, and our greater society. Last paragraph, we're walking out today to join the Boston-wide march 
in uh, protesting the corporatization of higher education as part of the global Occupy movement. Since the biased nature of Econ 10 contributes to and symbolizes the increasing economic inequality in America, we are walking out of your class today both to protest your inadequate discussion of basic economic theory and to lend our support to a movement that is changing American discourse and economic injustice. Professor uh, Mankiw, we ask that you take our concerns and our work out seriously. So, you saw that some students took it seriously, others didn't take it seriously. Um, this is Act 10. Uh, you can see from the description how it might relate to the courses that you're taking here. How bad is this after all? And it's now combined with, uh, this used to be Act 10 alone, it's 10A, and there's a 10B, uh, there he is, and these are the subject matter that is taught there. These courses are required for all economics concentrators and a prerequisite for higher level courses in economics. So that is the approach that is taken at Harvard to introducing students to the field of economics, and that was the reaction of students to the course for the reasons that were just presented. Um, your course, uh, in economics, uh, I haven't attended, but um, I don't know if the students who, how many students here are taking this course? Uh, the we economics? We don't have the BA program here. Yeah, we have the Emmys program. Oh, okay, you don't have the Act 01? They're protesting by not coming. Yeah. They're not coming, so this is part, part of the walkout. So my question was. They walked out. <laughs> they walked out. So that was my question was to be. Whether or not, given the similarities, if there are such similarities, between the subject matter that Mank Mankin teaches. Students. Students. Yeah, OK, I, I put up the wrong slide. I, I tried to find what is taught in your basic econ course. This is what I found. It's very hard to find on the website of the school. So of course, the question is, should you walk out of your economics class here? And um, but there's this a difference in the four-year and a three-year system. Yes. So Yes. It, it works out again. So it's a three-year system and a well-thought-out system. And ten students walking out out of the numerous uh, students who take econ doesn't really say much. And the way of protest, uh, I, 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 I've, I've taught in America, not at Harvard, obviously. I've never attended Harvard, but in a decent place. So uh, I don't see why this should be uh, should be condoned and really kind of you know taken up as a real serious discussion. Of course, people should have a view as to what they are being taught. But um, as in comparing it with the JGU syllabus, yes. uh, as it was on the board, uh, um, I, mean, uh, I really can't get uh, you know, the ideas where are we driving at. Because you have to agree the, the system under which we work, the three-year system, where we can't afford a kind of a general view. So it has to be a micro, it has to be a macro. You know, so uh, so I, I understand the need for it, I understand the need to think about it, but you know, it, it, it puts people in a very bad light. Tell me, you know, you have JDU syllabus up there and we are up for open discussion. Uh, maybe this makes you so. Uh, so I, when was this protest? 2011, but we're coming to Have 2007. There been a protest after that? It is six years since. Yes. Has there been the protest subsequently? Well, that's what I was coming to. So. That's exactly what I was coming yeah, to. You are trying to revive something, you know, that fizzled out and dead already. So and, uh, that, is, that is one of the core questions that we're asking here. Ha is this something that has fizzled out? Is it something that was misguided in the first place and therefore fizzling out is fully justified as the Occupy movement has fizzled out? What's left of the Occupy movement? Now, is that because the forces that sustain the content of economics teaching and the functioning of the financial system that people were protesting against in Occupy movement have prevailed, or that 
the contestation was misguided in the first place. Let's relate it. We're going to come to those questions and, and challenge them. But let me first uh, introduce the Manchester debate. The article that was circulated to you uh, describes the activities of these Manchester students as ranking among the most startling protest movements of the decade. And they ended up publishing a book, defining a new concept of iconocracy, defined here as a society in which the goals are defined in terms of their effects on the economy, which is believed to be a distinct system with its own logic that requires experts to manage it. We're going to come back to that. They created a network in something like 43 uh, places around the world of rethinking economics, including this one in India, uh, rethinking economics, R-E-I-N, <coughs> uh, in India is uh, part of this international network of students, academics, and professionals building a better economics in society and in the classroom. And this describes what the India-based uh, branch of this global movement are doing. Now, in presenting this, I'm not yet taking sides, which well, is what you, you were are, getting at. You are, because you see the protest was about corporatization of higher education. You yes. have left that completely out. Well, just is, focusing on economics. So you're already proceeding in a certain way. No, no, no. The, the, in the letter... It says corporatization of the higher education. Why not talk about that? The corporatization why, of higher yeah, education. Why you leave that out? I didn't. I quoted you that have, from... You have not spoken a word. You're just focusing on economics. No, no, I'm introducing the, sub, the subject with the yeah, no, comparison of the two debates. The substantive no, discussion is what's coming. He's not biased. I'm saying that you're already biased. No, no, but let's, okay? let's hear what he's because saying. you are focusing on your one part of the protest. Okay. You're not focusing on my entire protest. I'm just introducing the fact that there was a protest in 2011 yeah, in, in, at Harvard. There was a protest in 2017 in Manchester. Mm -hmm. So the question is, does this have any relevance to uh, the way economics, or the meaning of economics in higher education? And uh, econocracy is challenging it. So we're getting at this. We'll, get, we'll bring in the corporatization issue, if that's the issue you want to discuss. But let me ask your reaction to the three big arguments of the book that came out of the Manchester debate. According to the review that was circulated to you, the first of these arguments is economics has shoved its way into all aspects of our public life. True or false? You, have a, you think it's true? Millions of people operate, they don't need to uh, even know or attend a class in economics. It's purely, it's common sense, you know, like demand supply. You don't really need to enter or, you know, read a mandatory book. It's, it's, it's just this and subject, it kind of puts it into a dissonant analytical structure. That's what it does. Stephen, yeah. I will have object to the word thought. <laughs> it uh, should be it. accepted in all that <laughs> <laughs> This is a direct quote from the... <laughs> <laughs> it may be, but you know, you're in my... No, no, no the, the, the <laughs> authors of econocracy... <laughs> there, you have to be careful about The authors of econocracy are, are protesters. What do you show me? <laughs> Why the word show? That's already show, you know, the kind of uh, prejudice thinking. Okay, shove is a bad word in here. Everybody's agreed? Okay. Yeah, it should be replaced by accepted. Accepted is a way of life. So, no. Embraced. Is Embraced. Yeah. Embraced warmly. Yeah. Embraced with slobbering kisses. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the second point make, they make in the book, Econocracy, is that economics is being pushed, Again, shoved, pushed, uh, and it's a narrow and recent invention. Now, I'm not an economist, so I can't judge this question. It's Main of the yeah, main arguments of that book. Is that true or not? That, you can't take that position. You can't talk about those things and say, I'm not an economist, I don't own those. The moment you speak, you own those things. No, no, no. I, no, no. Can, can I'm quoting. Can I'm quoting from the. No, no, but he's just quoting something that has happened no, but in my There are thousand things. What he's quoting let's, is let's, let's, let's hear what he has to say yeah. by way of his own opinion. So my question is. Yeah. Are these three big arguments of this book, Econocracy, that stem from the protest in Manchester, meaningful to you? So we have uh, the second one. We have a registered um, uh, contrary position. And the third one, economics, have turned much of our democracy into a no-go zone for the public. In other words, public, stay away. We run the show. This is not for the general public. The, the economy operates behind the scenes, experts run it, public stay away, democracy does not mean you interfere 
with the economic processes. Yes, let's see. Do you agree that uh, physicists have turned much of our like physics thing, science thing into a no-go zone for the public? Yeah. I, I, I think everybody's right. economists. They read a business standard. They, they read economics time. So they are all economists, but unfortunately, yeah. not on the contrary, I think that everyone in the country is an economist. Everyone in the yeah, country is an economist. So that's a problem. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, th this was <clears throat> to set the stage. The topic is what can what is the significance of these two events? Epiphenomenal from one point of view, nothing fizzled out. So what? A couple of uh, disgruntled students publish a book called Econocracy, pretty poorly written. Uh, in any case. They have a movement that they claim to be global. So there are a few disgruntled students in different, including in India, that uh, feel they're joining in on that. Doesn't mean anything. Rachel's gone on to other things. All these students have gone on to other things at Harvard. It's over, epiphenomenal. That's one approach to say. The other approach is to say that the questioning of the underlying assumptions of material that you're taught especially as a requirement in a university, is something inquiring students should be able to question. Now, whether they're right or wrong on economics and on Act 10 and in Manchester and so on can be looked at in the details and the specifics. And that's the value, of course, of Mankiw's uh, responses, that he's engaging in that debate, saying, good for you. You're questioning these things. But you got it wrong, and let me straighten you out. And so you read that in his, uh, in his responses and in his defending the 1%. But now I'd like to move to the challenges of learning in the field of economics. I think that this debate causes us to reflect on how useful are the models used in economics for understanding the processes of markets and exchange. Are you learning in your econ courses what genuinely describes what's going on in the real world? Now, this, you must have views on this. I, well, I think this is a 50-year-old debate. Yes, much there even older, a yes. a lot of things written on this. Yes. And the issue was settled in favor of model. Okay? Because you can con check consistency of your arguments. Without model, you cannot do that. Okay? Without a model, so you cannot check really, on the consistency of arguments. Really going back to 50-year debate, I can yeah. refer you to the literature if you want. Okay? There are volumes written on this. Yes. Right? And broadly, the idea is the following, okay, that you have a model, you continue to refine the model, and you expect that, you know, your current model may not be quite realistic, but you expect that over time it evolves into a model which is near it. This is the methodology that is used. Okay. So the article that was distributed called uh, of empty, bo uh, empty Economic Boxes, uh, you distributed that, I think. Uh, uh, Dates from 1922, I think. Yeah, that's right. 1922. Yeah, so. <laughs> so there we are. There's but part of the answer to the question is that, that people have been challenging the models of economics, applying mathematical tools to things that are much more complex, that involve uh, values and so on. And when you sanitize it in a model, you're going to miss something. Or, as you would say, alternatively, as more information becomes available, we perfect the model. We do a better job of it, right? Okay. And then we have some in the back, too, but you're... Yeah. So maybe we should allow him to speak rather than... I no, 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 I think, no, 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 this is no, no, a no, dialogue. I'm just running a discussion, yes. No, it's disruptive for others. I think it's disruptive for others. He holds no brief for economics, so he's only stimulating a dialogue. So go ahead, yes, what did you, what was your thought in the back there? Let me quote Professor Ariel Rubinstein, Yes. So he actually once wrote an article where he said about this issue that if you're ready, it's a very fundamental issue that are the models good predictors of what happens in real world. So he said that suppose we are reading a table, suppose it's soft squares, okay? So it has a very moral value to it that something we can apply in the society. But does the table itself, the story itself, be applied directly to the real world? No. So economic models can be thought of as tables, which are the structures based on which we can have something to say about the real world. Though they are not the exact replica of the real world, but it gives us some framework, some model, some structure based on which we can say something about the model. I know that it's a very, it's very abstracted from the real world. It's 
there are lots of things happening on the real world, but you, but this gives a baseline structure where you can add different things, which will give you better predictors for the real world. But the model itself is not the real world, as a model yeah. itself is not a real life society. Yeah. Or, or let me give you an another example, which I often use in my class. Right? Take, for example, a road routes to one city to another city. Right? There are many bands, curves, and so on. But you can have an abstract where there is a straight line on which the various cities are shown. Right? Mm -hmm. You abstract away from certain things, but you know that map that you draw as a straight line, you have all the essential information that this town will come after this town will come those things that there are curves and bands and ups and downs, those are in another one. And that's what the models do. So okay. any, any persuaded? So any model of you know operates at a level of abstraction from reality. Yes. So even in physics, for example, you know, in when we talk about gravitation, we say that a feather and a steel ball fall at the same speed. Or oh, you don't actually observe yeah. that. Because that is in ideal conditions when there's a vacuum. <coughs> vacuum yeah. Usually you have some other force working <coughs> in the real world, friction or something else, which prevents it from falling. The second thing is, I think the more important question to ask is, have our models gotten better? And certainly our performance has gotten better because the kind of crash we saw in 2008 is the crash we saw in 1929. But it took the United States more than a decade to get out of it in the Second World War because we did not understand how to get out of it. They were practicing frugality, and frugality was not getting them out of it. This time, in 2008, we had a much faster recovery. It took basically three years for the GDP to start going again, two to three years. To, for the GDP. So how quickly have we recovered? You know, so I was, you know, I agree that some of my, I mean, I teach MAMQ myself, but what MAMQ teaches is pretty much standard in all economic programs. This is what I learned at Delhi University. This is what I learned at Johns Hopkins. This is what I learned at Hull. There's almost no difference yeah. in micro and macro anywhere in the world. Now you could say that, you know, why is this taught? And that's a good question, you know. Uh, you're right, there are, it has human values missing. It has the cost to individual human beings missing. But you know, maybe you know what needs to be done is students should be taught sociology along with their economics. It should not be a program purely focused on economics in that case. But if you're going to, uh, you know, I mean, this, this uh, uh, there are a lot of economists, even Paul Krugman, who's on the left, his economic textbook is not different, very much different from mine. I mean, there are some differences in emphasis, but they're marginal. Like Menkyu, I also uh, studied, yeah, uh, I also studied talking about standard textbooks, Samuelson. Most of us did uh, for, for many generations. So, so the point that is emerging here is that there are standard textbooks that have a value because the models that they project are knowingly not an accurate description of the precise reality that we're confronting, but are accurate in showing the global path. Objects fall. They're theoretically, they fall, at the, uh, regardless of their mass, at the same speed. In practice, things are different because of <coughs> friction. Same thing with the road. The road may meander, but if the model simply shows the path is going to take you through these seven uh, towns, and here are their names, and they're on the path. You're learning something from that model. It's useful. Sorry, there's some, you were who is over here? Yes. Yes. Who is going to? Yeah. Yes. You're. Yeah. So I, 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 I don't feel like you sort of resonate with what Nelson just said. That maybe economics should be taught not only just sociology, but also in political science. Absolutely. Well, perhaps, say, perhaps that's why the models are so abstract yeah. in the modern iteration of economics that there is no uh, discussion of friction. So how can economic principles be actualized without the political institutions? And to answer that question, yeah. we, have, we have an answer coming from here. Yeah. Not an answer. Actually, my point of view is, actually your objection to models is not about models. It's about assumptions on which the models are based. So he is not objecting not to exactly, models, yeah. by the way. You. I'm okay. saying that yeah. we just present yeah. the evidence that I'm presenting is to instances in which institutions of higher education objected. Yeah, so my idea is, it's not actually the model outcome that they're conducting, because they read the assumptions which seem uh, non-real, but a model should not be just on the assumptions that it takes, it should be just on how best the model represents the reality or how best the model 
represents the data that we see. And it's an empirical question whether models work or not. So out of one billion models and huge data set that you have, if you run a regression, actually you will see in in, in the end models are uh, the models are representing data significantly higher than no models case. So we're get, what's emerging yeah, here yeah, is but, but, but yeah, go, go ahead. Right. Right. Comments. Go ahead. Are, are models ideologically neutral? I think that's the issue. Here. We're coming. Yes, you you've anticipated yeah, where we're heading. That's two, right. <laughs> can I make two comments? Yeah, of course. You. Uh, one is, you see, somebody said, why not sociology or political science? Why do you put the entire burden on economists? Why don't sociologists teach economics? Or why do not political scientists teach economics? Why do you think e economists should do everything? No, there, no, is there, there, there is a second question also. Okay. There is no, political no, second economy. is a comment. Uh, you see, about no, what is one European economist, whom I admire quite a lot, described mm -hmm. modeling in the following fashion. Let's suppose you have a stone, right? And you have to chisel and you have to make something out of it. You will slowly chisel away all inessential parts. And that's what the models do. They chisel, they chisel away all inessential parts. And actually, a good model should be a very brief model. Okay? It should not be very big. It, to realize that what is essential and what is not an essential is itself an art. That's a very interesting. Yeah, so that's a very interesting to addition to the discussion. I, is I, that I the, also want to do something. With, uh, yeah. I think we need to also keep in mind uh, two things. One, that there is a debate about what should be taught in the discipline of economics, and there's another issue about the practice of economics. I don't think there is a problem about, you know, the kind of concerns which have been raised, insofar as teaching economics is concerned. You ought to know what is otherwise assumed or seen by a large, larger community as an outlier yeah. as the case that you ought to know on which you then work to contextualize the concerns of a particular situation in order to deliver a better practice. So I, I'm, what I'm saying is that this debate is otherwise not a very conclusive debate. You will have arguments and counter arguments. Sometimes it is helpful to look at this debate in, in terms of what ought to be taught in economics and the practice of economics. Then perhaps I think it becomes easier to see and appreciate the opposing, opposing the, perspectives. The third part, the third set of questions is going to be on the practice. How the, uh, but now we're on the, the, the learning. So one of the uh, messages that is emerging from this discussion is that the question of how useful are models in understanding processes of markets and exchanges and other things that are going on uh, is pretty damn useful. Uh, although uh, those who are intelligent in utilizing these models know their limitations. And there is a value in chipping away the unessentials to get at uh, a law or a model that uh, can clarify our understanding of processes. But there's a value to that chipping away of the unessential. And that's what models do serve a useful purpose, at least according to what I'm hearing around the table. Yeah. But we've heard mainly from men. <laughs> this is International yeah. Women's Day. Let's get, let's get the next question. Well, in your let's, let's hear what. Also, there are hardly any women. <laughs> he prepared it prior to the Women's Day. You know, he did it on the Men's Day, so. <laughs> so do the premises of economics as taught here and in the major universities favor the dominating classes. Let's get back to that political setting and the sociological setting. And therefore need to be critically challenged from a political perspective. Now isn't that what it's all about? That isn't that what those protests were really all about? Is that the way economics are taught, according to those who are criticizing it, are um, hiding the fact that they're perpetuating and justifying what most people would call the capitalist system. Now, that's a political choice. Is it then, therefore, appropriate to challenge it critically from a political perspective? Instead of saying pure models and so on, you're explaining it very clearly in that context of the models, but you're not fooling me. I know what's behind that, <coughs> even though you don't have to say it, is that you're buttressing a particular system called the capitalist system. So if I go along with your modeling and reasoning and so on, 
I'm buying into that system. And hold on a minute, let me look critically at that system. So there's the alternative perspective. How do you feel about that? Professor Should it Marx, be challenged? The same um, economics is taught in Scandinavia. The same economic models are taught in Sweden and Norway and Denmark. You know, I think the problem is not that economics is broken. I think your politics is broken. Your political system is broken. You know, who's, because where, where, I'm talking about the United States. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think the problem is... Well, next thing you're going to have me <laughs> speaking on behalf of the Bush, uh, the Trump administration. <laughs> I can see. So I, I don't, I, no, what I'm saying is that you can still have a market economy. The Swedish economy is a market economy. The Danish economy is a market economy. But you can have fair outcomes on the basis of 50% taxation, 55% taxation. It's not that they are unaware of that. And they deliver growth and they deliver also equity to their citizens. You know, If you can't do it in the US, it is for different reasons. It's not because economics is to be faulted, you know, and the economic model is to be faulted. There are a lot of economists who have spoken about the value of human capital, none more than our own Amartya Sen. You know. yes. And there's a whole generation of economists who are focused on how, you know, uh, uh, welfare is also growth enhancing, you know, in many ways when it's delivered right. So maybe the theory is right, but the practice is wrong. <laughs> but even let's go to the political perspective that he's referring to. Let's go to the other extreme. Let's become. Let's go to places like Venezuela. Let's go to places like North Korea. Are people much better there? They are, no. of course, for sure, they are not capitalist societies, right? No, no, not only that. You see the Soviet <laughs> Union. Or even to India before 90s. Okay, which even to India before 90s. We were not a capitalist society at that time. Right. We were doing wonderful. All right. right? People don't you like are you going to join in? Like so the dean's going to join in. <laughs> no, no, I, I say, say, he's going to say something about International Women's Day. No, no, this is. <laughs> no, I mean, you see, this, this kind of argument, um, firstly, the assumption that somehow there are eternal verities and absolute certainties in the discipline is, is wrong. There can be uh, different uh, viewpoints and different takes. It's got the many kinds of. Uh, economics, uh, which are also fairly rigorous and thought through. Uh, for instance, what happened here in India was um, there is a certain fascination about a group of experts. Now, this applies not just for the cult of the expertise among economists, but among lawyers or chartered accountants or engineers. The All professions tend to make themselves out to be um, uh, holders of very specialized knowledge which others don't have, and therefore that knowledge must be valued and you must pay for it um, in whatever ways. And therefore that's normal. In all disciplines, there's a certain uh, specialization, a certain... So what happened in India was that um, when the fourth plan model was being formulated in the planning commission here, Mr. B.K. Nehru was our ambassador, and he went to uh, MIT. And at MIT, there was a project uh, which incidentally led to a distribution function in economics called the Chakravarti Ecos uh, Lefebvre Parik uh, CELP uh, distribution function. Like Very the, impressed. The wow. Function. Two, two of them are Indian. So they were working at the MIT yeah. at that time. And they made a presentation to BK Nehru saying that India's Indian economists, the planning models are all wrong because they've been inspired by the Soviet model. And we've run through these things, and uh, our uh, work shows that if India concentrated on the manufacture of wage goods for the masses, for the larger market, it will generate more employment, more incomes to more people than this heavy industry biased models that uh, India has been following till now. And, and therefore, this is what India should be doing. So Vikan Aero writes, to the uh, deputy chairman of the planning commission at the time, Mr. Ashok Mehta, saying, I went to MIT and they made this very <laughs> convincing presentation that we should change what we've been doing. But this letter got leaked. And the moment it got leaked, um, it, um, Samar Sen, who was editing a journal called The Frontier in Kolkata, uh, printed this with the title, Whose plan is it? The allegation being that these guys at MIT are CIA agents, um, and what they are saying shouldn't be believed. So what I'm trying to say is that you know you can you can put on a or you can say these guys uh, sitting here, Mahalanobis and uh, Pitambar Pant, 
and so on are uh, Soviet uh, acolytes um, who are uh, starry-eyed about the Soviet model and, uh, and those guys are uh, you know, pushing for some capitalist structure. So you, these things you can do, but it doesn't take away from the fact that you can do some serious work where you demo, where you critique something that's been done and you say this would be better. Now, today, Amartya Sen and Jean Dres would agree that one of the mistakes of India's uh, choices in its development path was uh, the Feldman model and the concentration on heavy industries. So there's accumulation to knowledge. You learn from experience and so on. So there isn't anything inherently about economics as a subject. I mean, you can say, oh, the, this is the Bombay school or this is the Delhi school or th these characters are from here. Uh, the Chicago boys, the Berkeley boys, uh, you know, you can say all these things, but, but it doesn't really, you know, so you must differentiate between that and the political ideological purposes to which people may put their knowledge and say, oh, you know, uh, Ramjit Malani is appearing for uh, uh, Kejriwal, um, you know, against Jetli. Now, you know, he's using his legal expertise in the service of somebody. Somebody is using their economics expertise in the service of somebody. So we must differentiate that from what constitutes the discipline. Uh, economics is a very long-standing discipline. It's a discipline where people have worked on it and uh, you know it's it's in a way a process of continual improvement it's a subject that only gets better uh, because of uh, engagement of so many minds on, on on the issues that the subject is trying to grapple with and if you don't do that and you start, start blaming the subject rather than the fact that people may misuse the fact oh you know people go about strutting saying that yeah i have a harvard degree therefore i must be immediately appointed or uh, listened to I and mean, it happens uh, you know i took a lady who did double blind tests uh, on um, uh, efficacy of uh, deworming this is public health um, maharaja sayaji rao university department of home science uh, a wonderful set study on two sets of schools where one set of children got the deworming, the others didn't, and documented the beneficial impact of deworming on school children. And when we took this to the finance ministry, uh, Mr. Monte Kalawalia just said, now I heard the same Monte Kalawalia go gaga and call everybody down into the planning commission uh, when some Michael Kramer from JPAL made exactly the same presentation 25 years later based on a study done in Kenya. Now, this is because he's coming from MIT, Harvard, JPAL, uh, you know, people sit up. Now, these are all human foibles. It has nothing to do with the content of the subject. So, uh, the premises of economic as taught, of economics as taught here in major universities uh, do not necessarily favor the dominating classes. They favor, they, they provide tools for understanding the functioning of the economy that can be used by different people in different ways, yeah. but not necessarily a built-in bias that comes from uh, utilitarianism and is contrary to uh, redistribution. As you pointed out, you can have Scandinavians studying the same thing and have a highly redistributed uh, tax system. Uh, so it's not necessarily favoring a, a, a dominating classes. Um, I'm trying to summarize a very complex debate that is taking place. Anybody else want to add to yes, this? Yes, I, I want to add yeah. something. This is really something more to it. The students were protesting not about inequality in Germany. They were protesting against inequality in America. Okay? So the same students are not concerned about inequality, say, between Americans and, you know, starving Africans. We're not concerned about it. We're not protesting about it. So there is a difference, right? And the same thing you see in other aspects. Take, for example, climate change, you know. <coughs> U.S. see and they consume 10 times more carbon dioxide, right? okay? Save in India. But still, there is, they, they want, don't want to do anything about climate change. They expect the developing countries to do something. Students are not protesting against that either. So this protest against inequality is very selective. 
and in some sense self-serving. All right, so the, but the proposition are you, are here. Are you trying to say that that <laughs> is because of political factors? Well, it, 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 it could be. Color. No, no, it, 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 I'm saying I think it is political. Really, and protest is political. Pro yeah, protest is political, but yes. the choice of the issues to be protested on, is that also political? I don't think yeah, that is. Yeah, because it's selective inequality. Why not be concerned about inequality, just not in America, no, but across the entire world? Sure, sure. But you have to see who is protesting. Is it the student community? Student protesting, yes. yes. But don't you want to give the benefit of doubt to the fact that this student community is also constrained by the level of uh, uh, awareness or the lack of ignorance, which makes them take up larger issues which are global in nature, etc., etc.? They are looking at an issue which is in front of them. Look, I mean, there and, and people are starving in Africa. That's not hidden from any, you know, any educated person. Mm -hmm. right? Sure, it is. That, that is and also that protested. There is a huge you, difference you do between have the living standards in the U.S. and in Africa is also not hidden. So if these students don't know this and they don't want to protest, no, my, my point is very is limited. Selective protest. No, my point is that it is not fair to look in the nature of these protests. Uh, the fact that. There is a political choice being made by the protesters on the issue that is being picked up. These are random protests. And you can't give a political motive to the fact that a group of students in a class have decided to uh, 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 question the content of the subject. And they are not I bothered about are, larger we inequality. We are wavering here as to what is being questioned here. Okay? What is being questioned? They don't know that well, it's not really the contents of the subject, as far as I know. It's, it's the times they are. The concern. I mean, you know, in 1968, the whole world had uh, movements uh, starting with Paris. You know, it just happened. Uh, you, but so it, it just demonstrates a certain larger so, view of, 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 you know, political engagement is good in students. Let's get some more uh, yes. views on this. But I, I, I do want people to address the proposition and tell me if I'm distorting what you said, that the students who are demonstrating in these two instances were protesting against inequality in their own country. And that those same students tend to be, I'm sure you didn't mean absolutely, tend to be blind towards inequality elsewhere and blind or towards issues of across, in other countries and between countries, uh, unequal trade and unequal uh, distribution globally, and uh, also tend to be blind to the responsibility of their own country for global warming. True or false? Not always. I mean, I can give a quick response to this. It's a very standard thing that's, that's laid at the door of many protests, which is that either you're told that you don't protest the issue at hand, and you must protest everything else altogether. Whereas the nature of politics is that you must protest the issue at hand, the thing at hand. I, I, it's an empirically verifiable thing about whether or not these students in particular are on the whole more likely to have been concerned also about the issues that they raised. However, in the course of political protest, you're going to obviously concentrate on the issues that are at hand. Otherwise, you'd be accused of being some woolly, fuzzy headed Marxist who's thinking about everything and not protesting about these solid things that are on the ground. So, you, you know, you get it either way. That, 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 that really is, is neither here nor there. Um, but I, I mean, I honestly say this as a, as a complete non um, uh and, and I was curious about a couple of things that, that came up. I, I, I thought both the metaphors that, that you both used were very interesting because they were both artistic or literary, literary metaphor. It's, it's a metaphor of a table or a metaphor of uh, a sculpture. Now that sits somewhat uneasily with, say, the physics metaphor, which is of a slightly different order. And I feel like economics has both of these ambitions uh, and in some senses is trying to <coughs> have its cake and eat, which is interesting. Um, the, 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 the second aspect of this that, that really seemed to me uh, quite interesting, and again, I, I say this without having seen your textbooks or without having known what you, what you, what you teach or what you study, uh, is for instance, uh, how central is the Scandinavian model in, in what you teach? Because the, the question as I, as, I, as I saw it was how do the major universities teach these kinds of things? So is the 55% taxation of the Scandinavian model presented as the best possible way of going forward of balancing that is exactly. all these I agree with you totally that uh, there is not the no, case. That is, he's Could right. I finish? I, also, yeah. also with, with respect to Venezuela. Actually, Venezuela, whatever its other problems, and it has many, it is capitalist and undeniably so. Uh, secondly, it had excellent outcomes in terms of doing something the US wasn't able to do, in terms of actually reducing inequality during this whole period that, you know, this, this was happening. Now, uh, am I to believe the dismissiveness of Venezuela and what it has or 
blockchain as more of the same. And the third point that I want to raise, sorry, because Please go ahead. It's all for International Women's Day, so. <laughs> uh, which was the, the question that you raised. Uh, I think uh, points, rather than saying that it's simply a question of personal boyhood and, and so on, uh, the introduction, uh, there is a question here of can there be a certain amount of self criticality built into economics? Will economics, for instance, see and build into its question? The fact that it is particularly close to power. That in the society that we live in today, economics as a discipline is not in the same position as, for instance, history as a discipline, is not in the same position as English okay. literature as a discipline, with two corridors of power, right? And is that relevant or irrelevant to the teaching of economics? Uh, it, would that be a legitimate question to build into? Uh, I, That's a, uh, I, I want to add something about the metaphor thing. Okay. Uh, about the Professor Prakash uh, mentioned that uh, we chisel out all the unnecessary things. That's actually what we do in economics. And then let's say I'm chiseling out and I have made a fantastic model of a small uh, railway engine. And that has the wheels, that has, let's say, steam engine, because I'm not very conversant with the design things. It has a shoot with spews out the smoke and it has wheels and everything and it looks exactly like a steam engine and in abstract we can understand that if the wheels move things happen inside the wheels move and the train pulls up to that understanding how the train engine works is fine but question is will that engine if i put it in front of a actual rail compartment pull that rail compartment that's the task of economics isn't it that we understand how it works but then, when we put the modeling to work, really cool. does it work? Krishan, can I say? Yes. So maybe we, we are confusing, with, uh, so it's a bit, it's a bit has two parts, a theory part and an engineering part. Right? Maybe we are uh, confusing between the theory part and the engineering part, because the, the steam engine that you are, the example that you were giving, so when I write a physics model on a steam engine, it might have some abstractions to it, but when, I, when an engineer builds a steam engine, it will be include all the... I will, I, I will, uh, no. Then I will, I will just uh -huh. add one thing. That's, that's absolutely true that it, physics has two parts. One is the physics itself, theoretical physics, and is, another is the engineering, where the rules of physics are uh, realized into some machine which works. But in that engineering part, you have to actually take into account the friction and everything. But where is that, within economics part, where is that engineering part of economics? So the question is, are we building models for the heck of building models? Or do we want to use those models to make a difference to life? Yeah, I so the question, the, the question, part? the question I, I want to rephrase is, the, the question I want to rephrase is, yes. teaching of economics is one thing. And I am for actually teaching mainstream economics. But then, when you get into practice, perhaps you have to add on. You have to contextualize. You have to bring in other normative consideration. You have to bring in sociology, politics, etc., etc., because that is reality. Only then you can have the right outcomes. Yeah, but so, this, this but so teaching, teaching and practice has to be kept and that <coughs> parallel. Left to the so individual. Person, then you do comment on it. No, I, you have lots of experience in exactly. So, so I, that's, that's why I said. That's why I said this debate yeah. can never be conclusive yeah. unless you segregate the two issues. Okay. See, this we're, we're going to we're going to come to me, other just, examples. Yeah, I was just reminded of uh, uh, of uh, another story from Planning Commission. <laughs> <laughs> now this is a um, this is a this is a book by uh, a Nobel Prize winning scientist. Um, it's called Pluto's Republic, mm -hmm. um, and in that he has um, a discussion on economics. Right now he begins. It's a nice book. It begins with. He's talking to his neighbor. He's retired from Cambridge. And his neighbor says, oh, professor, what are you doing now? And he says, well, I'm trying to write uh, some philosophy. And she says, oh, have you read Pluto's Republic? And he thought this is a great <laughs> title because it's about the role of money in influencing science and research in science. Okay, so what he says there is that the mistake that many people make is that economics tries to imitate the methods of the natural sciences. You know, it uses maths, it sort of, you know, seem like all this rigor. So, but, but therefore then it leads many of them, who are practitioners, to think that the sign of intellectual manhood in the subject, and he used the word manhood, 
is that you can use these sophisticated techniques. And, and, and his point is very simple, that economics deals with people, human beings, who are essentially unpredictable. Their sense of freedom consists in not being totally predictable. They are not automatons. They are not robots. Uh, the, whereas with physics, the heavenly bodies move in the way they move, regardless of whatever theory you formulate about their movement. Whereas any theory that you formulate about the behavior of economic agents, the theory will influence their behavior subsequently, either to confirm it, disprove it, or do something else. And therefore, a certain humility in terms of what it is that the subject is trying to do and what is its subject matter is in order. That, that, that I think, um, is un mm -hmm. would you agree with that? I think so. There have been a, a whole lot of really rich issues that have come up. I, I just want to, since I have the advantage of being able to sort of chair this, sort of chair it, uh, a couple of points that you raised. Uh, sorry, I didn't get your name. I mean, yes, I mean, um, uh, One of the points that you raised is the phenomenon that I saw referred to recently as uh, but what aboutism. So the so but what aboutism is the but what aboutism, put it, make it into one word, but what it is is but what aboutism. In other words, the argument, when somebody is making an argument and you respond by saying, yes, but what about, and you change the subject to avoid responding directly to the argument. However, in that case, the but what aboutism uh, in relation to the commitment and engagement of the students involved politically in contesting the way economics is taught. In my experience, quite frankly, these are the same people that are contesting unequal globalization. These are the same people that are contesting uh, the major industrialized countries, the US at the forefront, being responsible for, uh, for uh, climate change and, and uh, global warming. Um, there tends to be uh, actually uh, a progressive agenda, if we can put it that way. And that's why I was deliberately using the uh, political perspective here, thinking critically and challenging the dominating classes, those who do that tend to have a progressive agenda that also includes a critical examination of the real causes of climate change, a progressive agenda that includes the real disparities in the international political economy. So even though I acknowledge the whataboutism argument uh, is, often, uh, is often used, in this case, I would challenge the proposition. I think it is the same people who have a progressive. It's what uh, actually uh, uh, Linky refers to as the, he refers to the left's arguments. I, I don't like that term. And he capitalizes left and so on. It's an easy way of saying people who disagree with me, I will categorize politically in one particular way. Uh, but whether you call it the left or progressive arguments, these issues tend to go together. The, the, the general contestation. But there's another point you raised that I think is worth, before we move on to the third question, for each of the three parts, I have three questions. Um, it has to do with the particular nature of economics as not being like other fields, where those who tend to dominate the discipline seem to tend to have access to the power structures. Now, in the case of, uh, of uh, Greg, isn't it true? I mean, at the time of walkout of Act 10, he was the uh, economic advisor to Mitt Romney's campaign. But prior to that, wasn't he the head of the Council of Economic Advisors for Bush? He was. He was. For Bush, yeah. right. Yeah, actually, so we are talking about somebody who really is in the center of the policy field. And I think that this is not uncommon among people who dominate the field to have that privileged access so the question then becomes, you could find a more neutral way of posing the question of whether those who teach um, economics are, in fact, part of a class structure. And those who are challenging them are not just challenging the models in the abstract. They're challenging them from a political perspective. And that, I think, uh, so part of this discussion uh, has brought that out. And again, I'm not. I'm not taking sides. I'm simply noting the fact that this tends to be the case. I wanted to make get a provocative clip. I had the clip from the uh, the walkout of Act Ten. I wanted to get a provocative clip from um, uh, no from uh, the movie um, uh, The Big Short. Uh, who's seen The Big Short? You've seen it, yeah. You see what, what? What do you think? I mean, it has. To, I'm, I'm relating it to your question about 
those who tend to dominate the teaching of economics reflect those who actually control the levers of economic power. And that's kind of, that sense of that power structure is so palpable in that film. What did you think? Uh, I, I, I agree. I mean, and again, I think the point that's been made about politics is well taken because, I mean, that, that film has a, has a bunch of people who would predict that, you know, the market would, would be doing these kind of things. They were just marching to the, to the, to the field in that case, right? They weren't listening. Yeah, they weren't, yeah, they yes. weren't going to be easy. So I, models are important, but um, I yeah. think it's a wrong impression that economists are very powerful. <laughs> they, are, they are not, okay? Power lies with the politician. A politician will always find an economist who will support what the politician wants to do. And Menkew got into trouble because he got into, you know, the advisory council. This protest against him would not have been there if he were not. And in fact, a good economist will not get close to the politician. He'll keep away from him. So he is politically challenged from, uh, critically challenged from a political perspective. That's exactly what happened. Let's see if we can provoke some yes, more sir, discussion. I think, uh, uh, Mitt, you have, yes. So, so, so I want to actually take up Professor Malhotra's point, uh, you know, and possibly uh, put it in a larger context of the university as an academic, uh, academic organization. So if you have a theory and if you have a practice, and if you, if there's a general consensus here, that certain subjects like economics is closer to the power structures, is it not really become the moral responsibility of the academic institution to invite the practitioners and praxis to influence the, the, uh, the theory? So shouldn't the university be at the intersection of actually inviting Absolutely. the practitioners into a dialogue with the theoreticians and Absolutely. vice versa? Absolutely. Absolutely. So why do so such few universities do that? It's, it's the culture of our society. Well, it's not culture. I think there are differences. The theorists look down upon practitioner, and practitioners look down upon theorists. This is a fact. Practitioner think theorists they don't know reality. I, I think I like to put it doing something that is useless. I, and these theorists think that these guys don't do no theory. They are just doing yeah. the bidding of the politicians. I like to That's put that thing slightly differently. I think we all like to look for those areas where we feel comfortable. It's the comfort zone. And we build our own ivory towers in our own comfort zones. But that's not good for the society. Exactly. See, I'll give you an anecdote. When I was stepping out of the government, I was struggling to get on what is called a deportation, which means I could retain my lien on the job that I held with the government and you know, fertilize my mind and perhaps at a later date, go back and do something more constructive in the government. That kind of interaction or exchange is not available in our society. And, and we need to do that. Where, where are the crises having the largest impact? It's in, in the developing world. And we have to wake up to this kind of exchange of ideas on an on a organized basis to infuse and fertilize the two domains so that we can have better outcomes. Ultimately, it is about making a difference to the, uh, the life that we want to live, uh, well-being, human well-being. And if all this is getting compartment, compartmentalized and I'm happy writing a book with a very esoteric model which half of the people do not figure and the other half just don't even bother to look it up, what use is it? What use is it? So there has to be that fertil fertilization across streams. And until unless we do that, we will have these kind of protests every now and then. Let me move to a, a, another um, version of the debate. Well, but before before oh. you move, in, okay. move there, um, I'm, I'm reminded of, a, of this rabbi joke. Um, so there's this rabbi, uh, and a chicken farmer comes to him and says, look, I've started this chicken farming business but my hands are all dying. I don't know what to do. You know, you know, you're a wise man. You know the, the scriptures and so on. So can you give me some advice as to what I should do in my predicament? And that guy says, yeah, now, are you downstream or upstream of the Jordan? The guy says, my farm is downstream. So you see, that's the problem. You know, the pollutants and so on coming downstream. You move your farm upstream to the Jordan, and you'll be all right. So the guy invest money, moves upstream. 
and his chicken are still dying. He comes and says, my chicken are still dying. What am I to do? He says, ah, but is it on the right bank or the left bank of the Jordan? That makes a difference. And he says, well, I'm on the right bank. He says, no, 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 you must move to the left bank. And then you'll be all right. So the guy moves to the left bank. And then he, he returns to the rabbi looking very happy and beaming. And the rabbi says, oh, fantastic. Your business must be very successful. He says, no, Rabbi, what actually happened was all my chicken died, so I started another new business, and that's doing very well. And then the rabbi started crying. And he says, Rabbi, why are you crying? He says, because I had so many good solutions to your problem that, you know, can't be tried out now. You're closed. <laughs> I guess I get the message of that. <laughs> Has something to do with International Women's Day. I'm sure of that. Okay. Um, I... Got the address wrong. I thought I was coming to. Uh, I thought I was coming to J and U. Uh, I was in the wrong place. But uh, okay. What what did, point did you uh, want to get, yeah, please? I, you know, I got a bit provoked. Maybe yeah. I should start okay. a little bit of. Um, you know, I started my education <coughs> as someone who was really following economics, and I started in Thailand, and I followed the U.S. Went to Geneva, and I lost economics, and I understood that you know economics can be really good. This is good, then. Uh, Professor was talking about people. As far as we really use economics for people, it's really good I and mean, it's empowering. And of course, we can deny what economics has brought to the world in terms of development. But if we really focus in one dimension of economics, which Mohammed Yunus of Bangladesh is really talking about, if we really focus on this part of maximization, then we make people in our class, we discuss this all the time, we make humans. And we treat them as means, not as ends. That's when the economics get really active. And I actually understand those students because I felt sometimes to walk out, but I was just like, walk out, where to go? <laughs> <laughs> so then the thing is, you can't even walk out because you're in a larger platform that you can't really challenge. I met quota system, for example. I don't know, India's quota system is two point something in terms of changing any international policy that's related to financial activities in the world. So yes, and we can't really, as, as Dean was saying, we can't really blame the subject itself. Yeah, if we really conduct, we really influence the subject. If we use it for the people, I think it's great. Because if they don't really use it for the people, and use, if you just take the labor, that's as itself as part of, as part of the means that we can just include in the process of profit maximization, that's the problem. I, I Very good point. Yes, please. A little bit. Okay. So I think, I think there's some value in, in critical engagement. And I think really, you know, uh, some of the objections that the students had was that this critical perspective was absent in the courses being taught. You know, I mean, all of us know that we are in a market economy and we don't really have to spell out the role of economists in running the market economy that we are part of. I mean, we spent like, uh, you know, the last weekend, all of us, in a conference on uh, solidarity economic practices and trying to understand how people respond to the market. And most importantly, how people are beginning to, in a certain sense, uh, feel marginalized from the larger market economy and from the larger you know, profit maximization, accumulation, consumption, production, orientation in, of the societies that we are living in. Uh, and and we've, you know, we've talked a lot about markets without a mainstream economist in the room. You know, I mean, it was, it was, it, it's, it's been a very, very productive, interesting debate because we also understand that, and in, in, it's not just in India, but all over the world, primarily uh, in, also in Latin America, for example, that you're beginning to see people resist the logics of the market economy uh, and the logics of this uh, of the system that are largely determined to a large extent by the kinds of things that people learn in a very mainstream economics course. You know, uh, I was reading some of the courses being offered in Harvard. You know, market success and market failure and stuff like that. How how does one really determine market success and or market? in economics. And for a non-economist, I'd like to understand. It is a success when you produce, when you consume, when you sell, and when 
What is it? It, it's it's a, a success a, when it is? Success when it is an optimal use of resources. Optimal use of or resources? Or you say efficient, efficient use of resources. Efficient. And to the second question, the second part, that people are marginalized and so on. That's not a problem with the markets. That's a problem with the wealth endowments. endowments. If you correct the wealth endowments and let the market work, they will lead to the disaster. But the market is resulting in taking away wealth from people. Okay. Let me say something about markets. Let me say something more about markets. You see, the Soviet Union experimented with doing away with markets, and they failed. So there is empirical evidence also in support of markets that they perform that task efficiently. Right? There are problems of with markets also. That is also discussed. It's not the economists are not open to it. You know, no. the model of markets that was 50 years ago is extremely different. Is a, you know, like a baby than the model of markets they have to get. So I think what the confusion is the word success and failure is not the dictionary yeah. meaning of success and failure at all. Market failure is totally yeah, it's, it's a different meaning. It's not failure as you find fact that you can but actually but she's study trying to market see success and failure without looking at the context in which that market is situated is really striking. No, they don't. They don't. So no, no. I mean, don't. You see, there's a, there's a beautiful uh, uh, novel by John Steinbeck called Grapes of Wrath. Uh, and there, uh, the, there's a bulldozer that they, they, somebody sold off all this uh, land and farms and so on. The bank has done that. And the poor farmer with his homestead is sitting there. And they've said, no, sorry, you're no longer here. You're out. We're going to put the bulldozer and uh, knock you out and this guy is fighting with the driver of the bulldozer and says why are you destroying my house and my livelihood and my everything and that guy says well, oh, what am i to do i'm doing my job i'm paid to ride, drive this bulldozer you know it's it's the banks that do it and it's that sense of when marginalized people are up against this, they don't know what it is they're up against what is it that they've done wrong they're trying to make an honest living and suddenly you know, some person at some other place has made some decisions that overturn their lives completely. It's that frustration that, that somehow, I think a certain empathy and, and a sense of these things are possible and therefore this kind of detritus must not be left by the operations of your market. Is, uh, that sensitivity is needed. And, and so what, what we'd like students to understand is this, that if you just left it completely to uh, you know, some force, you know, you may, efficient use of resources is fine, but, you know, uh, you could have a situation where, you know, for building 500 kilometers of road, uh, the United Kingdom, you know, may take 12 years uh, and uh, pay compensation and dispute resolution and all that, and China can do five times that uh, length of road um, all the way to Tibet uh, in, uh, much more efficiently because it simply ignores the the rights of uh, people uh, and just says you know out of my way now the question is now have you factoring that in that's the point efficient use of resources is is one thing but also um, human beings compassion what what's going to happen to them caring can I, can I, can I say something here uh, a lot of talk about theory applied there's this this is age old discussion and this inbuilt hierarchy that's there can see the inbuilt hierarchy, the streets also, because we keep on referring to physics as our, uh, you know, referring point. We, we all think in our minds that this is what we should have done. Mm. But the thing is, a theory is very important because I guess when George Bully was doing zero and one, everybody thought he was mad. But when uh, the application came much later. But apart from that, if I could say something about, um, in in US you have a pay as you go social security system, right? It's a huge financial. Uh, the sustainability of the entire system is really questionable, as in your fertility rate, your demography change, people living longer, whatever, and young, not that much. But then there was this talk, and I remember people were shutting down public schools, because you cannot uh, shut down pay as you for social security, there'll be a rebellion, no government will, right? But then people were shutting down uh, government schools during the crisis, and then you have such a well-established theory which links and Michael Baldwin, and these were the leaders over there, that this is 
an intergenerational transfer that you've made. If you want to assure that you will, because a paid as you go system is, you do not fund for your own retirement. You're, you, when you're working, you pay a payroll tax, and that finances the present old. When I grow old, my son, not literally, but their generation who are working at that point of time will finance me. That's the general understanding, right? So if I don't educate that particular generation, I kind of run into the risk that I will not be financed when I grow old. So these are two arms of an intergenerational transfer. And if you cannot win out the first one, as in you cannot stop the pay as you go, you cannot stop that arm as well. So the huge theory, and, it, and, I'm, I, and I, I'm sorry, I, I don't follow politics that much. It's that the economics go, but I'm a privilege. Uh, but the thing is, I remember one of the presidential candidates, uh, he said that, I mean, not in so many words, but at that time, I don't recall the exact line, that we need government funding and education. And that's that the rationale being, two arms have to be maintained. So theory is not always like we are talking, you know, in the vacuum, in the abstract. Some of it is, of course it is. But uh, it can be, you know, application, it, application, one has to figure out, it cannot be applied to any entity. It, 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 it depends upon who is applying, figure out, you know, which school needs to be tighter, which school needs to be a little bit, you know, uh, lax. But that depends upon who is applying, right? So theory, um, this debate has aged long, and it's quite, I find it quite meaningless because, the, you know, this debate about life, theory, what are the models doing? No, like no, no, I find it very meaningful. The fact no, that the we are debating in this no, debate, and we are, there are people who are consistently raising it, means yeah. it is meaningful. Yeah. All right, let's... Yeah, you give the finish. example of China building roads more efficiently. <coughs> okay. Firstly, the market's basic principle is property rights must be respected. Okay? Secondly, China is not a market economy in that sense. Because if they are overriding the property rights of people, that's nearly not what market requires. Market requires markets operate only if property rights are protected. So this, okay. There can be exceptions um, to property rights. Markets can operate with restricted property rights. Yes. But the question is, you see, what she said, intergenerational transfers, or when we spoke about how human capital can be enhanced by welfare measures which can enhance your growth. These things, it is true, are not taught in primary textbooks in economics. Economics 101 does not teach you that. So there is some bias. One has to admit it, you know. But the thing is that now we're getting know, at it. Now we're getting at the core issue but, here. There is some bias. But the I thing think is, I think most in 101 is not economics. Okay? Yeah, it's five percent of economics. Five percent of economics. Okay. You should not expect everything to learn through 101. That's a, right. the generation is like it's so impatient, they won't you know, these, these these classes are, to figure out where it's going. They need to know everything on the way it's going, otherwise they won't come. The students who are in economics uh, 10, yes. now coming back to the debate again, uh, economics 10, one zero, they don't yet know what is economics altogether. Yes. Whether all these debates, uh, whether there should be a theoretical <coughs> part and as, along with that there should be an engineering part of economics or whether economics should redefine its concept of efficiency or not, economic strengths of one zero have no idea about those. Mm -hmm. They have read some broad issues in broad statements, and mostly their knowledge is from uh, <coughs> newspapers and some preliminary economic texts, which are not even considered as Professor Chandra is saying, should be considered as respectable textbooks. It's textbook in the sense that everybody reads it, but does those actually contain what yeah, is actually in economics? All right, the definitive answer. No, so I they are see. coming out of economics. No, it's your first time. Your first time talking. So go ahead. Yeah. No, I just wanted to get into a couple of yeah. points because I think there are three major issues here. One is teaching of economics, the other is understanding of economics, the third is the application. Exactly. Uh, three stakeholders are completely different. Yep. Those who are teaching the discipline tend to think that they understand it better, and they can apply it as well. Uh, those who are understanding are students, and then there is this. A good teacher, nice student model. We are, we know what we are doing. Uh, we have understood. We claim that we understood the theory. All free market advocates are not neoclassicists. Uh, if you look at the Austrian school of thought, then they'll provide their own uh, framework to this. Uh, so I think if you're looking at largely the issue with respect to teaching, um, there is, uh, in, and we we we're teaching economics at and this this coming at the university level is coming largely the debate that whether you should probably have a core curriculum for teaching economics. I think this was largely being discussed and 
Uh, internally, I feel like, no, you can't do that because when you're studying, uh, let's say, international political economy, or you're discussing issues of international relations, your understanding of political science, sociology, um, and different aspects of the political philosophy as well should blend in uh, into your understanding of economics. So as economists also, when we're teaching, it becomes important to look at those factors. Now, yes, I, I completely agree with Professor Zandra that Economics 101 is not at all giving you an idea of what economics is about. And there is patience that is needed for students to understand. But yes, we can also look at the first two classes, and that's what one of the things that we were trying to do is, why do you need to learn economics as a discipline? Is it vital enough? Our mind works, and this is where you look to refer to people like Daniel Kahneman or you know, their work. Your mind is evidence-centric. It looks for evidence. Why, when you're sitting in a policy discussion, an economist is talking, a sociologist is talking, is, is historian is talking, historian is giving a narrative of what has happened in the past. Sociologist will tell you about a communitarian group. An economist is saying, well, OK, I understand those factors. Let me model it in, in these three, three variables, taking the assumptions. This is what the evidence is. Naturally, the person is acting on, and the mind acts in an evidence-centric manner, is going to listen more to what the evidence is. That's why a lot of psychology and sociology as well use uh, methods as well. The myth that you take qualitative instruments as measures of non-quantitative index is, is, is ridiculous. When you talk about using some ranking method, I think that's something which, which you do with social choice theory in a lot of the disciplines. You take it into consideration as a quantitative metric. So I think our teaching of the discipline needs to accommodate um, something that I mean, I would say Hajun Chang uses as a drinking analogy. If you drink too much of one school of thought, you, you're going to be plagued by a tunnel vision, um, a bad hangover, and a brain dead. <laughs> but if you use it in form of understanding different cocktails of school of thought, where the same market theory may be uh, taught, and then cross-validated, and critiqued in a span of two hours, I think you're giving students the word to understand what is there, who is going to apply and where the politics comes in? I think these are questions that we go far beyond, uh, I think, beyond the universities. So as a university, I think that we can look at those. That was, uh, frankly, I thought that was a, a, a brilliant summary of a lot of, the, of what has been discussed and an approach that can be taken to challenge that assumption that I hadn't heard until now, and we're already almost done, is the, uh, is that what is taught in Economics 101 is not really all that directly related to what really happens in the economy. But there are other ways of approaching it, and you've just suggested one. Uh, I wanted to um, suggest that we, I, actually the final question I had here is has lost its relevance, I think, that, that the critical thinking about what is being taught in economics doesn't necessarily require, as we've heard from your presentation in particular, doesn't necessarily require that you challenge it from a Marxist perspective. Nevertheless, if we were JNU, I think there'd be plenty of people that would be supporting a clear understanding that there is a scientific understanding uh, that is critical of mainstream economics that draws upon the concepts of Marxist thinking. And it can be scientific and not just sloganeering. I mean, not even sloganeering at all. It is a scientific approach to criticize uh, mainstream economics. And it may be what you were not excluding when you said that after presenting the main ideas, the, the responsibility of the instructor is to say, uh, this can be questioned from this perspective or that perspective. Is that what you were getting at, really? Yeah.